Good morning. morning. So good to see everybody. And happy Mother's Day. You know, I'm always um, trying to be mindful on Mother's Day that it's a a day of of, uh, so many mixed emotions, right? There's, for so many, there's, there's just joy and blessing and celebration and thanksgiving as you, as you think about uh, your, your mothers, your wives, and, and just get to, to honor and enjoy time with them. Um, but, but also realizing that, that Mother's Day is very hard for some people. Some, some who've lost their mother, and, and maybe there's mixed emotions, really warm reflections, <clears throat> or, um, but also the sorrow, the loss of them not being, being here to, to be with you on that day. Uh, some, as, as Tyler indicated in, in the article, that, where there's challenging relationships with mothers, and so there's, there's confliction there. Some who've, who've suffered miscarriages, and, and so Mother's Day is so hard for, for them. And so um, we learn um, from our Lord and, and through His Apostle Paul to, to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, and today's one of those days where we really Learn to, do, learn to do both. But I hope um, for all of us, it's a day of grace, it's a day of peace, um, a day of, of joy in the Lord, and, and, and if you're so blessed, a, a, a day of joy and blessing and, and a celebration with, with your family as well. I suspect that's why we have extra visitors today that you're here for Mother's Day. So let's, let's pray together before we be- begin. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your kindness towards us and your uh, incredible grace and, and love and bounty. Um, Father, please be with all of us today. Um, we're so thankful um, for the blessing that you give us through our mothers, um, and I pray that today can be a day of, of, of bounty and, and joy and celebration and uh, warmth um, and that you would also comfort the hearts of those who weep today and, and grieve, and that um, we as your people would learn to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Thank you for Jesus, and may we always learn from him and draw nearer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, well, we are continuing our series, Justice in the Kingdom of God. And so for our visitors this is, this is uh, number six in a, in a seven-part series. And so we've, we've explored in our first five lessons, if there's, if there's one thing that we've seen just as this constant drumbeat, it's the centrality, it's the pervasiveness, it's the overall weight of this idea of justice and righteousness in the kingdom of God. And we've seen that according to the scriptures. Um, from our, from our, fir- our earliest lesson where we were exploring the foundations of the, the biblical story and seeing God's purpose from creation, the laws in the Torah, the sermons in the prophets, the, 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 the laments and praises in the Psalms and, and, and parts of Job and the writings. And then last time as we, as we sort of stepped back and drew back to see the promises and the expectations about the kingdom of God, all of this, again, is, is speaking to the centrality, the, the pervasiveness, the, the weight of justice when it comes to God's purposes. I want to pause before we begin and just remember what we established at the end of our sermon last time in regards to promise and expectation in the kingdom of God. And so if you, if you think about just as we did our tour of Isaiah and we step back to say, okay, what is the hope what is the expectation? It was that God will bring justice, that his servant or his anointed Messiah will bring justice, that when he pours out the Spirit like this torrential downpour from heaven, that he will bring justice. And so we, we see the kingdom of God means justice and righteousness, right? That, that is what a big piece, a central part of God's purpose and the expectation. Um, and in all of this, in all of this, we saw that God's Justice and righteousness, God's judgment is good news. We're so used to thinking of judgment as the bad news, but in the scriptures, judgment is good news because God is good. Uh, God's justice is not merely, remember we we talked about this, God's, God's justice is not merely 
punishment, not merely retribution. Justice and righteousness in the kingdom of God is nothing less than new creation itself. Okay? And if there's, if there's a paradigm shift that I'd like us to get in this series, and if there's, if there's one idea and one image that I want to flood our imaginations and take root in our hearts, it's this, right? Justice is greater than punishment. It's new creation. Let that just seep in, take root, and start to fill us up as we think about what is justice? What does it mean to, to, for, for God's justice? And then therefore, what does it mean for us to, to do justice? And so the bottom line that we saw, God will make it right. Okay? So th- again, this is, this is review for us, but this is, this is seeing what, we, what we've looked at last week. Um, w- when we think about this idea that God will make it right, right? All the problems in the world, all the problems that are out there, the, the evils, uh, e- evils in individuals, evils in systems, and all that's wrong in here, in our, own, in our own hearts and lives. God will make it right. And so all of this that we've seen in our, in our recent lessons, all of it comes together today when we turn to the gospel, when we turn to see Jesus. Um, we'll see the, the promises and expectations turn to fulfillment. As we turn from the law and the prophets and the writings to the gospel, I, I want you to, to think for just a minute, though, what should our expectation be when we start to see the story of Jesus? What are we expecting him to come to do, to be and to do, right? We should expect him to be doing justice stuff, right? And that's, that's exactly what we find. I sort of like, um, but, but oh, and let me say, and not just, again, justice as we might have thought about in the past, but, but again, that, that new creation level restoration among peoples, among the world, that's what we're expecting him to, to, to do and to be and to bring. Um, but as, I, as I've said kind of repeatedly, somewhat joking, somewhat serious, as I, as I lament the fact that like really every sermon could be its own, every sermon in our seven-part series could be its own seven-part series, right? That's especially true today when we turn to the story of Jesus. And so um, uh, uh, then I've just broken it down into seven points then. So we'll, we'll kind of, you, you see what could have been, but we'll just like, we'll reduce it to just a few points. But um, you, you think about Jesus is the justice bringer. And there, there's all sorts of places in his story that we could zoom in and center on to really learn something about how he's bringing justice. The first is, is his birth and the events surrounding his birth, right? Think particularly, and, and, and I'm going to largely just draw off of Luke's gospel this, this morning, um, just so we're not flipping all over the place, but, but we'll pretty much start in, in Luke 1 and, and, and just sort of work our way through, even though we're not always going to stop and read. I'm just going to kind of allude to some things as we go. But, but you think about um, e- even Mary's prayer, right? After she's with Elizabeth and the baby uh, leaps for, for joy in her, her womb, um, y- you see this, this, this prayer uh, that, that uh, Mary prays. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I got that um, out of, no, that, that's right. Sorry. Anyway, Mary's prayer though, right? My soul magnifies the Lord. Um, Listen to just a little bit of the language that's here. Um, he, he's rejo- uh, my, my spirit's rejoiced in God, my Savior. This is Luke 1, now in verse 48. He has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. Behold, from this time on now, all generations will count me as blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me, holy is his name, and his mercies upon generation after generation towards those who fear him, for he's done mighty deeds with his arm. Remember his arm from Isaiah. He's scattered those who were proud, the thoughts of their heart. He's brought down rulers from thrones. And what's he done? He's exalted the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things. He sent away the the rich empty-handed. He's given it help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers. Right? Do you hear, now that we're we're really familiar with this language, especially in the the Psalms and in Isaiah, do you hear the justice promises in that prayer, right? Again, especially that idea of bringing down the rulers, raising up the poor, filling the hungry. There's a lot of resonance between Mary's prayer here in Luke 1 and Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 1. The same kind of reversal that Hannah prophesies about in her prayer, Mary's picking up in, in her prayer of, about what God is now doing in Jesus. Even, even Zechariah's 
prophetic prayer when he talks about salvation from our enemies, right? Again, that's justice language. So we could just center in on the events surrounding his birth and see justice and righteousness there. We could look at his mission. Think about Luke 4 in particular. Jesus is is leaving Capernaum. He tells his disciples, I've got to go preach the kingdom of God, for I was sent for this purpose. Now, having spent so much time in the, in, in, in the prophets and in, in Isaiah in particular, when we hear kingdom of God, what do we think of? What are we supposed to think of, right? God coming and reigning, and that means what? Justice and right. Just baked into it is justice and righteousness. So when Jesus is saying, I'm coming to preach the kingdom of God, he's saying, remember those promises, remember that expectation. That's what I'm announcing now. That's what I'm saying is coming to pass. But he he says something very specifically. If you look at Luke 4, um, in verse 16, he enters into his hometown of Nazareth, into the synagogue. It's the Sabbath day. He stands up to read the scrolls given to him. He finds the place. Uh, There it is. Isaiah 61. The the last passage we read last time in our Isaiah tour is the passage that Jesus picks up on, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach this gospel to the poor, uh, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, right? The the poor, the, the prisoners, this jubilee, right? All this justice language Jesus is saying, that's Isaiah. remember that's what we saw in our Isaiah study, and he's saying, today this scripture's been fulfilled in your hearing. So even as Jesus talks about his own mission, right, what's, what sort of is, is he drawing our attention to? That yes, indeed, I've come as that justice bringer. I've come to right wrong. I've, t- t- I've come to reverse those imbalances and those injustices, and I've come for the vulnerable. I've come for the people who are oppressed, the, the people who are, are down, and to raise them up and to restore. <clears throat> we, could, we could think about his teaching, his message. Um, <clears throat> again, we're just surveying, but we could zoom in on these things. Think about what, what's, you know, his most famous teaching in Matthew. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. We get the, the version in Luke. He's sort of on a plane as he's, as he's as he's saying these things. But just think about his words in light of the law and the prophets and the writings. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are hungry, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who weep now, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who right, are persecuted. Right? Again, do you see how this, this flourishing is for the vulnerable? Right? Do, you, do you see that, that same kind of justice language that, that he's describing? And, and he's pronouncing this message of peace and blessing upon, upon them. And then you think about a passage even like, like John, uh, uh, Luke 12. Right? He's, 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 don't worry, seek first his kingdom. But then he tells his disciples, he says, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. Right? Just this, this, this very simple, these simple words, but what's he, what's he instructing his disciples to do? To care about who? Poor people, vulnerable people, right? So, so his teaching, carrying further all that we saw in the law and the prophets and the writing. Or think about Luke 14, right? That, uh, um, uh, that, that <clears throat> time where he, he tells his disciples, or, and tells the, the people he's eating with, um, you know, when you, have a, when you throw a party, don't invite your family and friends and neighbors and the rich people who can benefit you. Go out and invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, blind, those that have nothing to offer you in return because you're, the, the reward comes in the resurrection. But what's the instruction? Again, it's justice language, isn't it? Right? Um, or, or even think about Luke 16, this, this story about the rich man and Lazarus, maybe, maybe a story that we've heard before. And he, he tells the story of this rich man, this unnamed rich man that he never names. He's not worthy enough to have a name uh, given to him, but he's just the rich man. And man, on, on, while, while he is living his life, things are great for him. And, and yet there's this, this poor man, Lazarus, who just sits outside the rich man's gates and just longs for the crumbs that fall from his table and the dogs lick his sores, right? As that story goes on, he says in, they, they die, 
and the, 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 the Lazarus is carried away to Abraham's bosom where he's nourished and comforted and, and, and all that. And then here's, La- and here's the rich man, and he's in torment. Right? Why did that, that rich man end up in torment? Not because he was the active oppressor, but because he was indifferent to the suffering of the vulnerable person around him. Right? So again, we could, we could just really root in Jesus' teaching and, and see how justice is a big part of what he's, he's teaching. We could look at his miracles and his meals, right? What, what these, these serve in the story as signs and foretastes of the kingdom of God, like we see in his, his miracles and his meals. Luke 5, right, where he's, he's famously eating with tax collectors and sinners, and the, 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 the scribes and the Pharisees are so upset about him, and yet he says, the, the, the physician doesn't come for the, the healthy, but for the sick. I did not come to call sinners or the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Or Luke 7. Let's, let's look at that one, because this, is, this really carries forward some of the Isaiah language. But this is the scene. John the Baptist has been arrested, and he, he, he sends his disciples on a little mission. He says, go to, go to Jesus and say, are you the expected one, or should we look for someone else? And so they go to Jesus, and, and they ask him that question, and listen to his response. The very time he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind, and he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you've seen and heard. Blind receive sight, lame walk, lepers cleanse, deaf hear, dead raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached at them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Right? Notice again how he, he, you know, he's, he's performing all these miracles. He's doing all these incredible things. Notice how he explains those activities in light of those kingdom promises, right? Those are signs and foretastes of what would be in the fullness of the kingdom. And, 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 and particularly notice how it's framed in terms of justice language, right? Uh, the, the, again, the, the, the meals where, again, he's eating with tax collectors and sinners, So again, any one of these could be its own sermon or more as we just think about, okay, what, what, does, his, what does his birth teach us about justice and righteousness? What, what does his mission teach us about justice and righteousness and call in us? What is his teaching? What is his miracles? What is his meals? But, but for our purposes today, where I really want us to center is the center place itself, the very crux of the matter, and center in on the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross. As Paul said, I proclaimed to know, I, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, and Him crucified. Truly, it's the, the death of Jesus on a cross is where we're going to see, and this is justice and righteousness coming together, every strand of it, right? You, you, you know, when, when we were, Tyler and I were talking to Ryan about the logo, I was like, man, you know, like, you know, the, we, you can't just make the cross be a logo for everything, right? Be, but, but it's like, like there, there's nothing else that, that ev- literally every strand of, of, of thoughts regarding justice and righteousness, it all comes to a head. It all comes together and finds its, its interpretation and its meaning and its, and its fulfillment and its resolution in the cross. And so that's what I want us to just think through. I want us to think about that story of the cross. Um, it could begin in the upper room as Jesus is eating with his disciples. And he, he's sharing that Passover meal and he breaks bread and he takes and he gives his disciples and he says, this is my body which is given for you. And he takes the cup. This is the blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then they leave and they go to the garden. And he, 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 he calls his disciples with him and he takes... Peter, James, and John takes them a little bit further in, and then Jesus himself goes off, withdraws to pray. He just says, just wait with me. Just, just stay awake. Please pray this, you know, so that you don't enter into temptation. I'm going to go pray. And he, he falls down on his knees and on his face with these, these sweat drops as of blood, and he's pouring his heart out to his Father. Father, if you are willing, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he gets up, and he goes to his disciples, and they're, they're sleeping. Could you not 
could you not stay awake with me one hour? Have, have you ever been there where you just, like, you're struggling, you're suffering with something, you, you just want, you don't want anybody to say anything or do anything, just be there, just, just be awake with me? And his closest friends just couldn't even, couldn't even give him that in this deep, deep, deep place of suffering, right? And, and he prays again the same thing, and he prays the same thing again the third time. It's time. And so then this mob comes into the garden and they've got clubs and lanterns and swords and all this stuff. And Judas, one of his his 12, one of his inner circle, one of his chosen apostles, one of his closest friends walks up to him, hail rabbi, talking out the side of his mouth and kisses him. And it was that kiss which was the sign to the mob that here's the one you're looking for. And so the mob arrests him, and his disciples start to fight and revolt, and he just says, put down, put down your swords. And so he's arrested, and he's, he's hung on, and, and then all his disciples flee, right? Um, e- even in Mark's account, you know, Mark's, Mark's account especially speaks to the, the the sort of chaos of that moment. Everybody's fleeing. And, and he even tells of one guy, probably even Mark himself as a young, young person, who's, who's just wearing linen clothes, in, in, in his haste to flee, runs away naked because his clothes get caught. Right? There's just the chaos of the scene. All his disciples flee, and here's Jesus alone, bound and beaten and drug off before the Jewish authorities. And he's, and he's before the Jewish authorities, and they bring before, before him all these, these false witnesses that they've sort of you know, got to testify against him, but they can't even align their testimony, what they're saying about, so so there's nothing that's sticking, but Jesus gives them just enough, as he quotes from Daniel in Psalm 10, to explain himself, and they accuse him of blasphemy, right? The Son of God, they accuse of his blasphemy. He deserves death, and they keep beating him and spitting on him and slapping him, and then they drag him before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And they bring him up, and they, 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 they bring these ridiculous charges of insurrection, right? That he's this guy who who's claims to be a king, and he's out to undermine Caesar. And, and Pilate can see through it, and he knows he's innocent of these charges. Yet he won't, he just won't say not guilty, and dismiss the charges, right? He, he continues to allow the, the, the mobs and the, the, the Jewish leaders to, to have a voice, and, and he bends and he buckles under that, that political pressure. And, and so uh, he, he, he releases this, this prisoner who's truly guilty of insurrection, Barabbas, um, but then Jesus himself what, what do I do with the man? And, and so they think, uh, let, let's just scourge him and maybe that'll get them to, to let him go. So they scourge him where they would strip him down and they would, they would take this, this, this cords and, and there, oftentimes there's like metal or bone or glass or rock that's sort of in this like multi-stranded whip and just flay him alive. And a lot of times people died in scourging. But then they heap him up, put that purple robe on him, the royal robe, and give him the crown of thorns and the reed in his hand as the scepter, and they bow before him. Hail, King of the Jews, right? It's all just mocking and shaming and humiliation. What should we do with your king? And they shout, crucify, crucify, and finally he hands them over to be crucified. And he's carrying the upright support for his cross, and he falls under the the weight of it, no doubt exhausted from the all-nighter and the scourging and all of that. Um, And someone carries the cross for him. But then they bring him to the place Golgotha called the place of the skull, and they crucify him. And he's got criminals on either side of him, right? One on his right, one on his left. And they write this inscription above his head, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And they write it in three languages, right? Again, just, they're, they're, that's the claim, that's the crime that he's committed, and it's just as mockery above his head, right? Yeah, he, he looks like a king as he would be, again, stripped naked, beaten, bloodied, scourged, nails driven through his wrists and his feet, and he's just up there. Again, all to degrade and to shame. And, and, and as the, the people pass by, right, the, the religious leaders 
drawing on the language from Psalm 22. They passed by hurling abuse, wagging their heads. He saved God. If he's the Son of God, let him come down from the cross, right? And, and even one of the criminals is, is mocking him and ridiculing him. And yet, as he's there, he's quoting Scripture, and he's praying, and even, even the, the, the desperate cry of Psalm 22 becomes his own, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Luke tells us, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, from Psalm 34. And he breathes his last. Death by crucifixion was as low and despised as one could get. It was regarded as a subhuman death. A death for someone not fit to live, not even human. It was a slave's death. The death of a nobody. It was a godless death, an accursed, God-forsaken death. Because Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 21 says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Crucifixion meant rejection and shame, the most debasing and degrading and dehumanizing kind of punishment. It was regarded as an offense against good manners to speak of, the, speak of this hideous death for slaves in the presence of respectable people. We have certain rules in our society, things you don't talk about at the dinner table. This was one of those things you didn't talk about. If you were around somebody with manners and, and, and of any class at all, you didn't, you didn't even talk about crucifixion. It was, um, it, it was the ultimate display of weakness and impotence, right? As, as someone's crucified, it's just stripping them down and showing utter weakness, utter impotence. It was not a clean death. It was not a noble or dignified death. Crucifixion was a method of execution specifically designed to intensify and prolong agony. Crucifixion was not just suffering, but it was a suffering that degrades. I'm going to just read a few quotes from Fleming Rutledge's masterful book on the crucifixion, because she can say it better than I can. It says, if, if Jesus' demise is construed merely as a death, even as a painful, tortured death, the crucial point will be lost. Crucifixion was specifically designed to be the ultimate insult to personal dignity, the last word in humiliating and dehumanizing treatment. Degradation was the whole point. Executed publicly, situated as a major crossroads or in a well-trafficked artery, devoid of clothing left to be eaten by birds and beasts, victims of crucifixion were subject to ultim optimal, unmitigated, vicious ridicule. Crucifixion was supposed to be seen by as many people as possible. Debasement from resulting from public display was a chief feature of the method along with the prolonging of agony. It was a form of advertisement or public announcement. This person is the scum of the earth, not fit to live, more an insect than a human being. The crucified wretch was pinned up like a specimen. Crosses were not placed out in the open for convenience or sanitation, but for maximum public exposure. Again, crucifixion as a means of execution in the Roman Empire had its express purpose the elimination of the victims from consideration as members of the human race. It cannot be said too strongly that was its function. It was meant to indicate to all who might be toying with subversive ideas that crucified persons were not the same species as either the executioners or the spectators and were there for not only expendable but also deserving of ritualized extermination. And finally, therefore, the mocking and jeering that accompanied crucifixion were not only allowed, they were part of the spectacle and programmed into it. In a sense, crucifixion was a form of entertainment. Everyone understood that the specific role of the passerby was to exacerbate the dehumanization and degradation of the person who'd been thus designed to be a spectacle. Crucifixion was cleverly designed, we might say diabolically designed, to be an almost the theatrical enactment of the sadistic and in inhumane impulses that live within human beings. And yet, unexpectedly and unimaginably, through this series of horrific, dehumanizing, and God-forsaken events, 
the Scriptures claim that the justice and righteousness of God is revealed. Wielding the first and decisive blow against the powers that have held the world under its dominion. Paul says it this way, So far as is possible for me, I am eager to proclaim the gospel to you who are in Rome, because I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation. And remember our Isaiah study, right? We hear salvation, we think what goes with it? Justice and righteousness. For in it, the the power of God for salvation. Everyone having faith, to the Judean first and also to the Greek, for in it God's justice, God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith as it's been written, and the upright shall live by faithfulness. Listen again, for in it, In this gospel message, this story of Jesus, particularly his death, the justice, the righteousness of God is revealed. And yet that's exactly what Jesus said was happening just before it happened, right? John 12, the prayer, the the, the sound like thunder, and what's he saying? Now judgment is upon the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. And John tells us he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die, right? There's something that's in him surrendering himself to all that horror and evil and shame and dehumanization and degradation and debasement, all that stuff. There's something that's happening in that where God, where Christ is actually winning a victory over evil. Paul said he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So what's happening is this public display of impotence and shame became the public display of God's power to bring justice and righteousness. As we said last time, Sin is more than something we do. It's a power that rules over us and enslaves us and holds us down. A power to which we are helpless to free ourselves from. There is no pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of option when it comes to sin. To say a little bit more, sin, right? All that evil and injustice that we've been talking about is both a problem out there Right? That, that's what we think of a lot of times when we, when we think about crying for justice, the problems out there, but it's also a problem in here. Right? It's a problem in here, within each of us. Or to say it another way, sin, all that evil injustice, is systemic and deeply individual. And Jesus, the true justice bringer, the revelation of God's justice and righteousness, came to make right all that is wrong all that's out there, and all that's in here. And he did it by giving himself over to crucifixion, where all the horrors of sin heaped up on him, where he who knew no sin became sin for us. And so we see justice and righteousness strangely, powerfully revealed. But the story doesn't end there, does it? The story didn't end with a marred body wrapped in a sealed tomb. What happened after Jesus died and was buried? Resurrection. We call that new creation, right? The stone rolled away and the tomb is empty. Life burst forth from the grave. The seed died and became a seedling. A seedling of new creation. And so remember what we said last time, and I'll say it again today. Justice in the kingdom of God is what? It's greater than punishment. Punishment is what the Romans were trying to do, what the Jews were trying to do. What happened? New creation. Doesn't that like blow you away? When you think about like, okay, so we've seen the retribution stuff happen when Jesus, but what's, how's it end? new creation. And yet, as amazing as that is, that that Jesus' story goes on to resurrection, new creation, the resurrection of Jesus is still only 
a sign and a foretaste of the fullness of resurrection, the fullness of new creation, the fullness of the kingdom of God. What's Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection of Jesus? He calls that the first fruits, right? The first round of harvest, the great harvest, the fullness of harvest comes when? On the last day when Christ returns and Death is, is once for all defeated, and it's gone. The last enemy is defeated, and we raise up, and it's life. It's right. It's kingdom. Fullness of life in the kingdom of God in the age to come, when all is finally and fully made right. And so we say... The kingdom of God has come and is coming. It came decisively, powerfully in Jesus, in his birth, in his, in his mission, in his teaching, in his miracles, in his, his meals, in his death, and his resurrection. And yet, man, there's still more to come. And so we say the kingdom of God has come and is coming. And we also can say the justice of right, and righteousness of God has come and still is coming. Today we've seen justice come. And so in our next and final sermon in this series, I want to look at our lives in between the first and second advent of Christ. Right? What is this life we live where we think about, okay, justice has come, and yet justice is coming. Right? And what is, our, what is our role in this story? What is our place in this story, in this divine drama that we have been called to be a part of? And so that's next time. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you. And we're so thankful for all that we see when we look at at the cross. And think particularly about the way that Jesus loved us and gave himself for us, but the way he also identified himself with our our sin and our suffering and all the, the pain and evil of our experiences in life. Especially those who've been victims of horrors and violence and shame. See Jesus meeting them in that suffering in the most profound statement of solidarity and closeness. And we see your work to overcome evil with good and with love and with generosity and with mercy. And in this you do justice and righteousness. Father, we long for new creation. We long for life we long for the fullness of glory in your kingdom. Always be near us and walk with us and help us. Teach us your ways. Help us to put off the ways of the world, the ways where justice is merely punishment, the ways in which injustice rules and reigns and is the way of, of things but to put on a genuine concern and love for people who are hurting and suffering, a concern for right, and may we be people who would be about making things right. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're with us this morning and we can, um, and just in need of anything, um, any, any grief or, or um, just weight that you carry that we can uh, help, help shoulder with you through prayer, through encouragement, through walking alongside you in any way, this is the time to let us know so that we can, we can, we can do that. And if, you, if you've never given your life to Christ and never 
pledged your allegiance to him and, and walked with him and, and been, uh, got to die to that old self and be raised again through baptism to live a new life with him, we would so love to baptize you in the name of Jesus today. If there's anything we can do for you, please come forward as we stand and sing.